Welcome to The Way of the Tyshire, Episode 4, A Brief History of Druidry. Although there are some who might disagree, it is my personal belief that the Druids were the shamans of the Celtic people. This would hopefully be obvious to anyone who studies Celtic lore and history in depth. Our order began as a Druid order, and as such we have, over the years, pieced together a great deal of Celtic shamanism from what we have learned from what others wrote about the Druids. Druidry saw its re-emergence as a spiritual path nearly three centuries ago. It is still largely a misunderstood path. Modern misconceptions about Druidry persist to this day. One of these misconceptions is that since all known Druids died out centuries ago, there can be no Druids today. While it is true that many Druidic practices disappeared with the coming of Christianity and the Roman Empire, it is probably also true that some of the practices of Druidry were absorbed into Christianity. For example, the custom of hanging mistletoe at Christmas. In either case, Druid Reconstructionists painstakingly research historical and archaeological records to discover what ancient Druids may believe and have practiced. This knowledge is then usually incorporated into the body of practice of modern Druidry. In the 18th century, largely because of a renewed interest in archaeology in the wake of the Enlightenment, a revival of Druidry began. This revival was inspired by the works of authors like John Aubrey, John Toland, William Stuckley, and Edward Williams. In particular, Edward Williams spearheaded the Druid revival in Wales and England. Williams is better known by his Druid name, Yolo Morganug. He founded the Gorsith, or the Gathering of the Bards, which goes on in Wales to this day. Morganug is often criticized for his tendency to invent things outright, but no matter how imaginative some of his accounts of Druid practice might have been, he was instrumental in reviving Druidry as a spiritual path. His seminal work on the subject is the Bardis. Although Druidry has been enjoying a revival for the past three centuries, there is no known straight-line descent from ancient to modern Druidry, just as there is no straight-line descent from ancient to modern times in religions like Christianity and Islam. This doesn't mean that Druidry is not a legitimate belief system for modern followers of the path. There are thousands of people today who call themselves Druids, perhaps even millions, and who practice variations of a nature-centered spirituality. Groups like the Order of Bards of Aten Druids in Great Britain and the Reformed Druids of North America and the United States have members in the thousands. Many other Druids worldwide choose for various reasons not to self-identify publicly as Druids and decide to remain anonymous. There may be as many as two or three million more Druids worldwide. There are probably as many types of Druidry as there are Druids. Some are polytheistic, some are pantheistic, and some are agnostic or even atheist. Some believe that gods and goddesses exist as a real separate entity, and others see gods and goddesses as archetypal energies. I began the Druid path in the late 1970s. Back then there was no internet. Finding information on paganism was difficult, and finding information on Druids was nearly impossible. That didn't stop me from experimenting with Druidry and Shamanism. Our grove cobbled together a system of knowledge and wisdom piece by piece from what we learned from shamanic journeying and the inspiration of the Imbus or the Alwyn. In the early days, we were an insular group, having little contact with Druid groups outside of our own. As paganism and Druidry continued to grow and spread, we began to make contact with other groups. As we gathered with these other groups to exchange information and to learn from each other, much to our surprise, 
We soon discovered that much of what we created had also been replicated by these other groups. They had experienced eerily similar things in their journeys to the other world. Although the knowledge of our ancient ancestors may have been lost to us, it is my belief that such wisdom is still accessible to those who know how to part the mists and enter into the other world, to learn at the feet of those who have gone before us. The fact that many different druid groups, working independently of each other, have arrived at the same rites and practices in our journeying, seems to me to indicate that there's magic afoot as we recreate Celtic spirituality and the way of the Typhir. For all the diehards who insist that what reconstruction is practice isn't real druidry, I would say to them, okay, tell me what else to call it, and you can call it that instead. Ultimately, every spiritual path had a beginning and was new at one time. Most paths began on the ashes of former systems, and the way of the Taifshire is no exception to this rule. Focusing too heavily on what ancient druids might have practiced, to me, is missing the point. Any spiritual path that does not change and adapt with the times is a stagnant and dead or dying path. The world is a much different place now than it was in the time of the ancients. And from this perspective, Druidry has merely changed and adapted to modern times. This is why the Order of the Tyshire includes information from revivalists like Yolo Morganug and Robert Graves, who is the author of The White Goddess and created the Celtic Tree Calendar. In our practices, such information is not what our ancient ancestors might have practiced, but it has proven useful in our modern practices so we continue to use it. We have a tradition in our grove that if you do it more than three times, it's a tradition. <laughs> this is also the reason that we changed from a Druid order to the Order of the Tyveshire in 2015. As Druidry continues to solidify in the modern world, we found that the definition was becoming too restrictive and dogmatic. So we changed the name of the order to reflect our more eclectic and inclusive approach. It is our belief that the age of an idea or the origin of an idea shouldn't be the only criteria used to determine the idea's validity and utility. Some people prefer the label Neo-Druid for contemporary druids because there's no straight-line lineage between ancient and modern druidry. They use the Neo to differentiate between modern druids and ancient ones. Isaac Bonowitz, the founder of Andreic Fane, or our own Druidry in Gaelic, broke this down even further into Paleopagan, Mesopagan, and Neopagan. Bonowitz used Paleopagan to refer to the original pagan indigenous tribes of Europe. He used Mesopagan to refer to the pagan based systems inspired by the Enlightenment era, such as Theosophy. Rosicrucians, and the Druid Revival. And he used Neo-Pagan to indicate modern-day Druids and Pagans. I don't use the term Neo. I refer to myself only as a Tyshire and a Druid. I also refer to my fellow Tyshires and Druids without the Neo-prefix. My reason for this is simple. Tyshires learn from nature. The natural world is our holy book. Since the natural world was around for billions of years before the human race came along, and will likely continue to be around long after we're gone, our holy book hasn't been altered since the time of the ancient ones. Therefore, if we're learning from nature, we're learning from an ancient source. Hence, I don't refer to myself as a neo tyfshire or a neo-pagan or a Neo-Druid. This viewpoint helps me to keep the focus on allowing nature to be my guide, rather than relying on the sometimes dogmatic teachings of others. From this viewpoint, Druidry becomes a more experiential and individually significant path. 
Another misconception about modern Druidry, probably inspired from 18th century engravings of old men in white robes, is that women cannot be Druids. Even in ancient times there were female Druids, and certainly today, in modern times, there are female Druids as well. And even though Druidry was originally a Celtic path, there are modern Druids from every race and culture on the earth. Modern Druidry is a path that is open to people of all races, genders, and nationalities. Since Druidry is more of a philosophy than a religion, there are people who are Christian Druids, or Buddhist Druids, or even Atheist and Agnostic Druids. This openness and eclecticism is continued into the order of the Taifshir. If you've ever seen a discussion of Druids in the popular media, you probably saw pictures or video of Druids gathering at Stonehenge. The hidden implication of these depictions is that the Druids may have built Stonehenge. The Druids were a Celtic priesthood and class, and the problem with such implications is that most historians and anthropologists agree that the Celts did not arrive in Great Britain until around 500 BC. Stonehenge was probably built around 1550 BC, over a thousand years before the Celts, and therefore the first Druids would have arrived. On the other hand, the Celts were more of a culture and a language group than a race of people. It could be that Stonehenge was built by an earlier people, and when the Celts arrived on the British Isles, they incorporated the beliefs of those earlier people into their own spiritual practices. The Druids were and are attuned to the cycles of nature, and Stonehenge is nothing if not a place to mark and celebrate those passing seasons. The association of the Druids with Stonehenge probably began during the Druid revival of the 18th century, when historians of the period had a tendency to associate anything mysterious with the Druids. This association may or may not have been erroneous. Time must tell as more archaeological evidence becomes available. What is certain is that the modern pairing of the Druids and Stonehenge has now been indelibly stamped into the collective consciousness. This can be demonstrated by the fact that modern Druids celebrate the solstices at Stonehenge. Some Druid groups have even replicated these enigmatic stone circles in places as diverse as Washington State, Missouri, and New Zealand. One final misconception about Druidry stems from Judeo-Christian heritage, and that is the idea that Druids worship Satan. There's a tendency among many interpretations of Christianity to depict any other gods and goddesses as satanic in origin. In fact, Christianity's depiction of the devil as a horned man was taken from the Celtic horn god Cernunnos. Cernunnos whose name means the horned one, is seen as the physical embodiment of nature in human form. He is a god associated with wildness and fertility. The early fathers of the Christian church associated him with their devil in order to discourage pagan practices. Celtic spirituality and paganism in general have no concept of Satan. The Taifshir path does not divide the universe up neatly in black and white, good versus evil terms. While many Taishers honor Kanunas, in our practice he is not associated with evil. Instead, he is the bringer of prosperity and joy, the guardian of the forest, and the lord of the wild hunt. So who were the Druids, and who are they today? The earliest known reference to a people called Druidae was by the Greek author Soton of Alexandria, around 200 BC. Although Soton's original writings no longer survive, Diogenes quotes him as giving a very favorable opinion of the Druids as learned scholars. 
Julius Caesar also mentioned the Druids in the Gallic Wars, written around 50 BC. In this work, Caesar tells of Druids practicing human sacrifice by burning victims alive in a giant wicker man. Since Caesar was attempting to conquer the Gauls at the time, many scholars questioned the accuracy of this claim. It may be true that the Gallic Wars was nothing but propaganda, at least in Caesar's account of the Druids. It is also true that many cultures throughout the world at the time, including the Romans, practiced human sacrifice of one sort or another. Attempting to judge cultures of the past through modern eyes is futile without a full understanding of the historical context. Whether or not it was true that the ancient Druids practiced human sacrifice it is certainly not true of today's Druids. What does the word Druid mean? Strabo and Pliny the Elder claim that this word derived from the Greek word for oak, which is Drus. If this is the case, then the word Druid could have come from the Greek for oak, plus the Sanskrit word for knowledge, or vid, from where we get our word wisdom transliterated into the Greek form, Yud. The combination of these would result in Dru Yud, or Oak Knowledge. Another possibility is the Celtic word for oak tree, Dware, in Irish Gaelic, a word whose root also means wisdom. The oak was considered the king of the forest to the Celtic people. It was associated with strength and greatness. Therefore, druids were the wise ones of the oak, or those who see all, or those whose knowledge is great. In other words, druids were typeshirts. This association with trees in general, and with the oak in particular, is probably responsible for the more popular misconception that druids worship trees. As with most misconceptions, there is a bit of truth in it, but it's not entirely accurate. Druids don't exactly worship trees. Instead, druids see that the energy of a creative force is present in the trees, and druids honor and hold that life energy sacred. While druids run the gamut in their personal expression of spirituality, from monotheist druids to polytheist druids, to atheist and or agnostic druids, they almost universally agree that the life force, called Njart in Scots Gaelic and Nuevra in Welsh, is sacred. So trees are just one of the many manifestations of the Njart. The word Njart or Nuevra means life energy or vigor. Yolo Morganug popularized the use of the Welsh version of the word Nuevra, as a magical word. He probably misunderstood the etymology of the word, which originally had no mystical connotation. But Nuevra has taken on a life of its own, pun intended, among contemporary druid circles of Welsh origin, as has its counterpart, Njart, in Scottish druid circles, and Njart in Irish druid circles. The way modern druids use the word, it now means life force or life energy. Some claim that this concept is the inspiration for the force in the Star Wars saga. The historical mythologist Joseph Campbell was an advisor on Star Wars, so there may have been a drunk grain of truth to this claim. To a Taifshire, everything is alive. This includes rocks, trees, plants, animals and even the earth herself. Everything has the potential to generate energy, and the sum total of the energy in the universe is the life force itself. This is the concept Morganug was trying to get across when he chose the word Nuefra. Fans of Yoda may recognize a familiar theme. You might ask, how can rocks be alive? The answer is that they contain potential life force rather than actuated life force. Rocks become dirt. Plants feed on dirt, converting its material into life energy. 
Animals then eat the plants, and humans eat both plants and animals. Think of it this way. If you take a vitamin pill as a mineral supplement, those minerals came from the rocks. At what point in the digestive process does that mineral cease to be an inanimate object and become alive by being a part of you? One of the deeper mysteries of the way of the Taishir is that we are all interconnected. A quote attributed to Chief Seattle says that what we do to a part of the web of life, we do to ourselves. This is because we are all connected, including our four-legged brothers and sisters. This is sometimes expressed in Wicca as the threefold law, or the rule of threes. What you do comes back to you threefold. When a Taishu talks of magic, he or she is referring to the use of Nyart to achieve a desired end. One of the shades of meaning of the word is the idea of weaving. We are energy weavers, so Taishers are those who weave the life force to evoke changes within themselves. These interchanges lead to a higher consciousness and a deeper connection to nature and to others. In that way, we create our own reality.
Although Druidry began as a religious and spiritual path of the ancient Celtic peoples of Europe, modern Druids and Tyfshers come from all races and cultures. Everyone has their own opinion of what it is like to be a Druid, but each of them also shares a few basic things in common within the framework of the way of the Tyfshir. If you could distill these characteristics down into a few principles shared by all Druids, you would probably come up with something that the Order of the Tyfshir calls the Four Sacred Pillars. These four sacred pillars are 1. Reverence for nature and for our ancestors. This means that Tyshers hold nature and all her forms to be sacred. Tyshers recognize that we are not separate from nature. What we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. We treat all life forms as sacred brothers and sisters on a journey together. Does that mean the Tyshers worship nature? That would depend on what you mean by the word worship. Personally, I don't like the word because of the negative power dynamics it invokes. I prefer the word revere because it indicates respect without suggesting dominance. From this perspective, we are all partners with nature and its creatures. Think of the respect you might hold for an honored elder grandmother or grandfather, and you'll gain an understanding of the difference between the word reverence and the word worship. While you may hold respect and even reverence for an elderly relative, you probably wouldn't worship them. Likewise, a healthy and emotionally secure ancestor or god or goddess would not want or require worship but communion. Such a communion would involve common reverence for each other and for the divine in each. The second sacred pillar is respect for diversity and individuality. This pillar recognizes the right of the individual to self-determination. While the path I walk is right for me, it may not be right for you. By respecting your right to determine your own individual path, I honor the diversity in the universe and in you. By expressing tolerance, I allow you the freedom to be who you are and ask that you grant me the same freedom. The Wiccan Reed ex uh, expresses this idea as, and it harm none, do what you will. In the order of the Taishur, this idea is expressed in the principle of prima non nocere, our first do no harm. Imagine what a different world we could create if we could all simply agree not to harm each other, in spite of our differences. Note also that this respect for diversity does not imply tolerance of intolerance. My intolerance of another's intolerance is not intolerance in itself. It is justice. Our order strives for social justice, and one of the principles of social justice is to proactively challenge intolerance wherever we see it, so that all people may have an equal chance at happiness and growth. The third sacred pillar of our order is service to the grove, to the community, and to the world. One of the aspects of recognizing our part in the web of life is the realization that we are all interconnected. If I work for the good of my own grove, my community, and the world, I ultimately benefit myself by improving living conditions for all. Conversely, if I act in a way that harms my community, I ultimately harm myself. This is similar to another Wiccan principle, the Threefold Law, which states that whatever you send out returns to you threefold. This has been expressed in Christianity in the idea of what you sow, you reap. In the way of the Taifshir, the idea is expressed in terms of balance. If you act in a way that unbalances nature, nature acts to correct that balance. Taifshirs actually work 
actively for social and environmental change, so that ultimately life improves for all. In doing so, we restore balance to nature and to the world. The fourth and final sacred pillar of the Order of the Taifshir is spiritual and personal growth. As a spiritual path, the Way of the Taishir offers many opportunities for learning and self-improvement. A goal of the Way of the Taishir is to always seek the Awan, or the Imbus. Imbus is a Gaelic word roughly translated as divine inspiration or spiritual strength. It is known in Welsh as Awan. The Imbus is the means by which we seek the beauty of the world around us. It is also the inspiration that leads us to seek visions and to walk into the other world. From a Taishir's perspective, knowledge and inspiration go hand in hand. Where knowledge meets inspiration, there is wisdom. So the Imbus can guide us to wisdom when we seek it, in knowledge and in truth. The four sacred pillars may be summarized succinctly as reverence, respect, service, and growth. So in answer to the question, what is the way of the Taifshir, I would say that if you have a deep respect for nature and for our ancestors, and an abiding love of diversity and individual freedom, and if you are interested in personal growth, And if you would like to use these interests for the betterment of yourself, your community, and the world at large, then the way of the Taifshir just might be the path you are seeking. The four sacred pillars are the core ethical principles of our order. They are the only beliefs required for membership in the order. Because of this, students of the order of the Taifshir are asked to think and reflect deeply on what the four sacred pillars mean to them. Consider the following questions. You may wish to answer these questions in your own journal or your own blog if you have one. In what ways do you show reverence for nature, for your ancestors? In what ways do you show respect for the diversity and the individuality that you find in your life? Are there any challenges you face in this area? In what ways do you serve your grove or your circle, assuming you have one? How about your community and the world at large? In what ways do you seek spiritual and personal growth?
In both the ancient and modern practice of Druidry, a period of apprenticeship is required prior to taking the path of the Druid. This is also true of the Order of the Tyveshire. The way of the Tyveshire is a lifelong path, and as such requires a lifetime of dedication. Such a commitment is not a decision to be taken lightly. Because of this, many Druid and Pagan groups require a period of reflection on what it means to be a Druid before accepting a dedicant into full membership. Brehan Law, the code of laws used by Ireland during the Gaelic period, prescribes a year and a day of consideration before making many major decisions, and many Druid orders adhere to this rule. Our order is no exception. The exercises and meditations in this podcast are designed to be completed over a period of a year and a day. During this year, you will spend time learning about the trees and the plants of the Oam, and following the earth path, and following the sun path, and following the moon path. You will also have the opportunity to celebrate the Wheel of the Year by participating in all eight of the high days of the Wheel in the Sun Path. Finally, you will be able to reflect on your own inner spiritual journey by completing the exercises in the Moon Path in coming podcasts. At the end of this year-long series in this podcast, you will have a good basic understanding of what it means to walk in the light of the Tyveshire Path. If at the end of this year you find that the way of the Tyveshire is the path for you, you'll be given information on how to self-initiate or to join the order. Be aware that if you're interested in joining a particular order, each has its own path for dedicants, so they may not accept the work you do with the way of the Tyveshire. If you're particularly interested in the order of the Tyveshire, then the work you do in the following year of this podcast will give you a good basic grounding in our ways and our teachings. The Order of the Tyveshire is especially geared to those who choose a solitary path. The way of the Tyveshire tends to be more solitary, although we do get together on occasion as well. Since many contemporary pagans of all stripes tend to follow a more solitary path, largely due to the fact that it can be difficult to find a local group since we're spread out all over the place. This year of podcasts will be focused with that in mind. When Taishers or Druids get together to celebrate the High Days, their groups are usually referred to as groves. A grove is the Taishers' equivalent of a church. If you find at the end of your year and a day of dedication work you would like to start your own grove, we'll be discussing that at the end of this year-long series about how to start one. We'll be giving tips and suggestions on the legal aspects, fundraising, and just good old contemporary group building practices. Finally, this podcast is... uh, geared specifically for the purpose of introducing you to the way of the Tyveshire as practiced by our order. If you'd like to join, membership is free, and we offer both online and face-to-face instruction through our website at Tyveshire.com. That's T-A-I-B-H-S-E-A-R dot com. If you'd like to join our order, you may find information on this website about us.
of the Tyveshire, we use the Celtic tree alphabet known as the Oum. In this section of the podcast, we will present one character of the Oum each week, offering information on the meaning of each letter of the Oum alphabet, trees associated with each letter, the healing and magical properties of each tree, gods and goddesses associated with each tree and letter, and the divinatory meanings of each letter of the Oum. Since we will be discussing medicinal uses of the plants in this segment of the podcast, please remember that herbal medicine requires caution and practice. None of the medicinal uses discussed on the Way of the Taishir podcast should be attempted by a novice. Some parts of the plants of the Oum are poisonous, and people with allergies should also be aware of the potential allergic reactions to plants. If you are interested in herbal medicine, Find a skilled practitioner and take lessons. Do not attempt to use medicinal plants without the supervision of an expert. The letter L in the Oum alphabet is represented by Luish. The plant associated with this letter is the Rowan. Its divinatory meaning is protection, security, and safety. You can crush Rowan bark, boil it, and save the juice to drink as a cure for upset stomach. Rowan bark is an astringent, and the juice of the Rowan berries can be used as a laxative. Rowan is sometimes referred to as the witch tree. This is because there's a tiny pentacle at the bottom of each berry of the Rowan. This pentacle, a symbol of the goddess, associates the Rowan with feminine energy of a divine nature. Rowan grows in seemingly impossible places like rocky crags, dark forests, and sometimes even inside of other trees. This ability to grow almost anywhere speaks of its refusal to surrender. Rowan energy is the divine strength of determination and perseverance. The word Rowan may have come from the Old Norse word runa, which means charm. It's the derivation of the word rune. So Rowans are also associated with the powers of divination, prophecy, and protection. The Order of the Taishir is based in the Southern Appalachians, and we use the local name of Mountain Ash for the Rowan. In the British Isles, the Rowan may be found growing in holy places and stone circles. It is possible that they were deliberately planted there to take advantage of their protective and magical power. Rowan is one of the nine firewoods to be added to the Balefire for the Festival of Beltane. The nine sacred woods of the Bellfire are birch, oak, rowan, willow, hawthorn, hazel, apple, grapevine, and fir. If you slice a rowan berry, it will reveal a miniature pentacle. Because of this, eating rowan berries puts you in contact with the other world and with the unconscious mind. The rowan tree is sometimes associated with the element of fire and with the sun. Irish druids sometimes call the rowan the tree of life, a crumbea. Rowan has been used to bless cows. First cut a rowan branch at dawn, then brush a cow's back with it. After this, decorate it with white ribbons and eggshells and fasten it to the barn door. This protects the cow. Planting a rowan tree on a person's grave will keep that person's spirit from wandering the earth. It is said that when the warrior Cohullan died, a rowan tree was planted on his grave. Gods and goddesses associated with this tree and plant include Tyrannus, the god of thunder, and Briad, the white goddess.
You've been listening to The Way of the Tithesher on International Pagan Radio, where it's all pagan, all the time. This has been Episode 4, A Brief History of Druidry. The Way of the Tithesher is the official podcast of the Order of the Tithesher. You can learn more about us at tithesher.com. That's T-A-I-B-H-S-E-A-R.com. If your Grove or Circle has an upcoming event and you'd like us to feature it on the podcast, let us know. The Way of the Tyshire is a weekly podcast. Get your information to us at least two weeks in advance, and we'll try to announce it for you. The Way of the Tyshire is a podcast about druidry and paganism, as practiced by the Order of the Tyshire. Paganism is a wide and diverse community, and we don't claim to speak for all pagans. We're always looking for interesting guests and topics. If you have a topic you'd like to hear about, or if you'd like to be a guest on the show, let us know at podcast at tithesher.com. That's podcast at T-A-I-B-H-S-E-A-R dot com. The Way of the Tithesher podcast is sponsored by Pagan Promotions. Learn more about Pagan Promotions at paganpromotions.com. Until next time, blessings of the ancestors.